Welcome to the Pursuit of Growth show, where we hold candid conversations with fascinating individuals from all walks of life, where we learn about their passions, their successes and failures, and their lessons learned, and how they apply personal growth to their lives. We end every single conversation with key takeaways that we can all implement to better ourselves and the lives of those around us. So as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good buddy, Greg Brinkley. Greg, how's it going? Man, it's going well, Sammy, and I'm very excited about the guests that we have joining us um, this evening. In fact, before we started recording, we shared the really one of the big inspirations of the book that we wrote, The Pursuit of Growth, was based on the fact that there is just an epidemic in our country and our culture in terms of mental health. And so we've got a guy that actually is doing something about it. Christian, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me, guys. Man, we are super, super excited to dive into this conversation. And for those of you that are meeting Christian for the first time, he is a technologist, a patented inventor, a serial entrepreneur with over 20 years of experiencing starting, building, and selling companies that make an impact on people's lives. His companies, listen to this, have saved thousands of lives and helped improve the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Currently, his work is focused on using technology to quickly and accurately identify underlying mental health conditions that are causing people to suffer. In his personal time, he teaches Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and works with disabled combat veterans. Christian, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to dive into things. Yeah, well, we're going to just jump right in, man. Tell us why okay. you created a company that's focused on mental health. Awesome. Um, well, it starts a long, long time ago um, when my first daughter was born. Um, she was diagnosed with necrotizing intercolitis, which basically means that her colon was dying. And she was just born. She was in the NICU. I was, you know, 21 years old, had no idea what was going on. It was terrifying because we almost lost her four times. Um, but during that process, um, I noticed um, that there were a lot of issues in healthcare and um, that there was a lot of opportunities to make a difference in that space. So I actually got a job at that hospital where she was, um, you know, admitted in the, in the uh, NICU and um, started, you know, helping on the technology side. And by the way, um, you know, she had a rough go of it for about a year and a half. She ended up having an ileostomy, which is basically a colostomy bag, only it's from the ileum, which is the small intestine. Um, and, um, you know, we had to put an NG tube in her nose to, to feed her, uh, which was wow. really a difficult situation, you know, as a parent, because you're, you're loving and bonding with this child while simultaneously strapping them to a board and shoving a tube up their nose every day. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, it, it was a learning experience, but during all of that, she's, by the way, she's fine. She's, uh, she is now a radiology technician for the, uh, the army and she's stationed in Germany. So wow. she, wow. she made it through. Okay. And she's, she's a little badass actually. <laughs> she does Brazilian jujitsu now too. So I'm proud of her, nice. but, um, uh, anyway, during that process, um, of going, you know, in the hospital, um, realized that there was just a, a, a lot of opportunity there. It was before electronic medical records had really been implemented. Um, there was really no interoperability and, I saw an opportunity um, to help make an impact there that if we could provide data to the doctors, that was much more likely um, that they could help patients real time. And so it's seen a vision of what that would really look like. So on my own dime, um, I took a couple of my buddies and we went down to Los Alamos National Labs um, and we met with the Advanced Computer Research Lab there. And, and it was the first time in my life that I'd ever seen real cloud computing. And so, of course, that was the greatest thing that's ever happened in the world. So <laughs> I was very excited about that. But I went back, I told the CIO of the hospital, hey, you know, I think the way you guys are going about interoperability isn't going to work. And I think that you might consider trying it this other way. 
And he's patted me on the head. No, nice job, kid. I appreciate your enthusiasm. <coughs> See ya. <laughs> you know? right. So, um, I mean, he was nice about it. He was a good guy. He was nice about it, but he just couldn't catch the vision. And the reason he couldn't catch the vision is because I had no idea how to explain it to him in a way he could understand. <laughs> um, so I ended up leaving, started my own company. Um, and I thought that I could make the biggest impact in healthcare by helping to in, implement electronic medical records. So yeah. went down that path, started implementing medical records all over the country, um, was traveling like 80% of the time, which was hard with, you know, four kids. Um, and uh, eventually um, that company ended up morphing through, you know, different events into um, a, a tech company that where we moved to Dallas and uh, bought, bought a medical clinic. And we decided to start using that medical clinic as a laboratory to test these theories and um, ended up doing a little bit of consulting worth, not paid consulting. It was free consulting. Thank you, U.S. government, but for the Pentagon. <laughs> um, so that was exciting to have, you know, hey, Christian, you have uh, the Pentagon on line one. <laughs> what? <laughs> Christian, thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So anyway, the long and short is we had delved into some areas that they were currently working on and we had already figured out. So mm -hmm. we were helping. We just did, did some free consulting and helped them figure out what we had already learned. Um, and in going through all this, and I'm weaving through this story here, and I apologize because it's a long one. But no, um, this is good. Uh, perfect. Thank you. But um, and there's lots of trails we could take with it, but ended up. Um, growing to 11 primary care clinics, um, manage them. You can't legally own them in the state of Texas, but we did everything except practice medicine. So we got, we were in control of the workflow and we were in control of everything. We were, we made them very efficient and, you know, very customer service, um, oriented and friendly and just a darn good place to work actually. Um, and, um, we, uh, realized that the, going down the path of interoperability, which by the way, is my patent. This is, I was a patented inventor. Um, I invented um, a way of basically making identity theft impossible or by allowing people to share information um, in a way that they were never identified. So there was no risk to the information coming out. So for example, if you know somebody had a heart attack, but you don't know who they were, well then, you know, it's just a, a statistic. Um, right. So, um, we were trying to go down the road of interoperability in the na and national healthcare, national infrastructure. Um, and uh, it didn't end up working out. There was just a lot of money and politics involved in that space. And we were too small and too dumb to really know how to break into it. So um, round about this time, um, I had a pers close personal um, family member of mine that um, was misdiagnosed by a doctor as a primary care doctor as having bipolar disorder. Okay. And she was not bipolar. And so for three years, she was on a very heavy medication that was horrible and just really destructive. But what she was really suffering from was depression, just regular depression, not bipolar depression. And um, so uh, we, we ended up um, during, you know, working in the medical clinics, finding out about um, the this billable code that doctors could use to test for mental health and knowing that mental health was essentially never being asked or never being talked about or never being tested for in the clinic in our own clinics um let alone you know any other clinic that we'd ever seen um unless it was a behavioral health clinic um we we saw an opportunity so um, got together with a couple of folks, a doctor, uh, actually two doctors. One was a chiropractor, so he's not a real doctor. And then an MD. <laughs> I tease him. I tease him all the time. He's like six foot six and 280 pounds and could break me in half. But, <laughs> but I say, you're not a real doctor. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, we ended up um, building a company uh, that to test for mental health. And mm -hmm. during that process, this family member was tested and we found out, lo and behold, she was not bipolar. And so one of the doctors that was part of our group was really into prevention and genomics and things like that. Tested her, found out that she had a mutated MTHFR gene, um, which was effectively making it hard for her body to methylate folic acid. One of the side effects of that is depression. And so um, she was able to uh, get the right, um, which was a supplement, uh, B-methylfolate, 
Um, she was on, put on the right, uh, right kind of medicine and still had issues with depression, but nothing like before, you know, where mm-hmm. we'd find her in a closet rocking back and forth with a pillow or, you know, something like that. It was, it was horrible, but it, it basically fixed her. And that's when I realized for the first time that this was going to impact people in a way that the interoperability could have impacted them, but I was 15 years too early <laughs> in that. Okay. And so this was a real opportunity where we could save lives. And by the way, the company's um, mission was to save and improve lives. Literally, that was it. So yeah. like, well, this is part of our mission. This makes sense. It's in healthcare. We can actually make an impact. There's no shark swimming in the water. This is blue ocean. Man, we got to do this. So built, um, built up the first mental health testing tool, um, ended up selling it to a private equity group who lovingly did what private equity groups often do, which is tank the company and mm-hmm. boot out all the founders and just make a mess of everything. Right. <laughs> so so um, uh, that's, that's when I started. Um, I actually, I ended up um, hiring some consultants on Upwork to do some pretty deep market research for me to make sure that the market for mental health was still what it was, what I thought it was, and that I wasn't blowing smoke up my own backside mm-hmm. just because I had already done it. That's what I knew. Was I going down this road just because I didn't know what else to do? And so it took me over a year to make the decision after, after I was booted out of my own company um, to, uh, to go down that road again. And um, I did a lot of soul searching and deep dive and decided to create Connected Mind and to create it in a way that I could never make the old company because there was too many cooks in the kitchen. And so um, by doing, doing what I wanted, um, you know, it was going to make an even bigger impact. And it's funny because I, I, have, I thought that this idea was very innovative, but I actually had no idea how innovative it actually was until mm-hmm. it started to find things that we had no idea were there. And then I could go tell you story after story of doctors that have talked to us about, you know, hey, this patient came in and took one of our paper tests and scored zero um, and then took one of, you know, the connected mind test and was severe anxiety with a plan to commit suicide. Mm. And when I asked her about it, um, she said she knew what the paper tests were and she just didn't want to talk about it. But wow. because connected mind was a different approach, it was electronic, it was less intrusive, it was less obvious what was happening. She was honest, to answer the questions, and basically we saved her life. And that doctor that told me about that, um, she uh, she called me up and said, hey, buddy, you just saved someone's life today. I was like, what? And she yeah. told the story. Well, I get stories like that all the time. So I'll pause. I've been talking nonstop for the last well, this is, minute. So. <laughs> yeah, no, this, this is fantastic. I think you really set a good foundation for the conversation we want to have. Mm-hmm. And so Sammy and I both have some questions specifically about Connected Mind. And, and personally, um, we use Connected Mind at Vogelaco, the organization that I work for. And I'll share a little bit about that shortly as well. But before we deep dive into the company, I'm curious, you know, in in researching you and researching um, just mental health and just the challenges we have in our society, one in five, I think is the accurate statistic, one in five people have a mental health issue. What do you think are the root causes um, of of really what we're seeing? And, you know, you know, words can be thrown around a lot of different ways. I think I actually said this earlier, you know, it's almost like a pandemic I feel like we're in, in this sense, society in terms of just mental health. Is it because we know so much more about it? Is it because we're being more honest with things we're seeing? Or are there some root causes that are complicating and and making mental health such a big challenge right now? If I knew the answer to that question, um, I think a lot of people would be really happy with me. (laughs) But what I can give you is I can give you some feelings around some some reasons why I think it's happening. Mm -hmm. But the short answer is I don't, really know if we are even capable of finding out that answer. Um, So a couple of the things I think um, are the cause is that I think just the way society is, the amount of information that's being thrown at people, the speed at which things work, the disconnection from community and family, Mm -hmm. um, 
are probably one of the biggest causes. And I think one of the things that that does is it creates just this lack of resilience where it starts at a very young age. You know, the story about the chicken when you, if you peel the egg back for the chicken and you don't let the chicken figure out how to get out of the egg, that Mm. it dies because it doesn't develop the strength that it needs to live. Mm. Um, And I think with a lot, with our kids, especially, we're so busy Um, and it's so convenient to put what we call the electric binky, which is the TV in front of them or give them an iPad, um, because we don't have time for them and they don't ever learn how to be resilient. And the other thing is that I I think with children, especially, and I guess I can say this because I'm a father of four and now I'm a a new grandpa as well. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about that, but congratulations. um, Congratulations. Yeah. He's a little stud muffin. (laughs) You know what they call the baby of a Marine? What's that? A submarine. (laughs) No, his daddy's a Marine. His mom is a air force. So he's, he's got some military blood. He's already received his first orders from the Colonel (laughs) to grow up and listen to his parents. Right. Yeah. Yeah, That's funny. But kids, they don't, um, they just don't learn the skills and everything gets focused on them where they become the center of the family um, you know, appease the child or, you know, keep the child quiet and they don't develop self-esteem like they, they used to by being part of the family unit where they're attached to something that's bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that could go down a whole rabbit mm-hmm. trail on parenting, but at the end of the day, it comes back to resilience. The, the kids are just not developing the resilience. And I also think that in society in general, yes, there is a lot more of a focus on mental health and what you focus on, you kind of create at some level, but that doesn't mean that mental health is not real because it absolutely is. And there are um, chemical imbalances in people's brains that cause enormous amount of suffering for them. Um, and also people develop patterns. So it's like ski tracks in the snow, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. Yeah. And Um, you know, people, um, they have a traumatic event or something happens that makes them really sad. And then they kind of go down the rabbit hole and they, they start to develop these ski tracks in the snow and they don't have the, the coping skills, um, to pull themselves out. And I think some of that is because there just isn't as much, there's not as many relationships, um, as there once were, there's not as much community. So I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit. (laughs) Well, no, and it's interesting you said this and and I want to let Sammy jump in here, um, in just a second, but you're familiar with Dan Miller. um, Oh, absolutely. As a speaker at Visage, we had him on this show a few months ago and I I might get the numbers off uh, a little bit here and there, but he talked about, you know, if you go back, you know, several hundred years in our world, the average person would have typically like a hundred close relationships that tribe right yep the tribe T- yep today we typically have fewer than eight yeah. um and, and i may be off on that it might even be sammy you may remember but it, it, it's it's very very low and of all the things that we can point to in terms of some of the challenges that we're having in all aspects of our lives the lack of quality relationships is literally just one of those just just red throbbing just pain points and so to hear you echo that really just caused me to perk up a little bit, but I think you're exactly right. And I think that's a big attribute to where you're seeing a lack of coping skills and resilience. Yeah, it. I know this is going to be a weird book to talk about in the context of what we're saying, but it's very relevant, which is uh, On Killing by Colonel David Grossman. But in that book, he talks about just how we, um, in society, we become so much more violent because we're not around you know, slaughtering our own animals for food, or we're not around, we don't have the same respect. We don't have the same community. So we don't have fathers raising the children. So the children are getting their, you know, um, they're being raised by music or videos or games, and they're seeing violence um, in, um, you know, a lot of different ways with no, no relationships to learn how to cope with those things. Whereas in the past, people saw violence, real true violence, but there was a respect and an honor for those things and not honoring killing, but meaning there was a respect that this, this animal gave its life so that our family could live. And we might mm-hmm. starve to death if we don't make it through the winter, you know, mm-hmm. and it's those close connections. I know it's a bit of a weird book to talk about, but that's really what he yeah. talks about in that book as well. So <laughs> That's interesting yeah. that Greg brought up Dan Miller because that's exactly the point where I was actually going to go is talking about that because as part of the, the coaching program that he had, I was part of for a while is 
learning and understanding those true connections and you see them in like i think in the maybe what you can conceive as third world countries still to this day like the yeah. ceremonies they still have right the 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 lamp the limited resources that they may have whereas like the family gets together and they're always together or they're um you know like they still go out and do any type of sacrificial like like killing of an animal and it's a big feast and it's a community there's a lot more of that that we see in some of those other countries and different cultures um than what we see now too because yeah i mean how many times you go to a restaurant today and like this is just like plugged into the kids hands right there and i'm a dad i mean i've, I've been there too I've, I've been i've got two young kids so it is very easy to just do this when you just need a break um from yeah it. so can't blame anyone but i think that the the highlight is to understand that that that's what this seems to be pointing at is the lack of the tight connections that we have as a family unit a family bond yeah and i also think we we um define success usually one way um, and I think this really boils back to the dichotomy of life. Um, again, not to go down a rabbit trail, but um, when you have an, a super excess of one thing, you tend to be lacking in something else. It's almost that yin and yang thing going on. And I think we, we, you know, we're hyper-focused on getting stuff um, and being super successful and having money. And those things are wonderful, but if they become your focus, then you lose something else in exchange for that space that's in your life so yeah and i and think you know, that the, leads to it the whole pursuit of growth lifestyle in the book that sammy and i wrote it is really a narrative about just that because especially in our culture we tend to this uh to you know look at success as status power mm -hmm. title wealth those type of things and to your point christian those are great things but what if you looked at life from a more diverse aspect and you looked at and we talk about 11 focus areas so what if you placed goals to say, what does it mean to be successful in relationships? What does it mean to be successful in terms of my character? So maybe not success in my wealth, but what does it mean to be successful in my financial literacy? What does success mean in my love and service to other people? And when you start placing your, your, your goals and your accomplishments in the active progress that come with these focus areas, not necessarily finite achievement, but the active progress of growing and the pursuit of growth, in these foundational areas, it really starts to get you that lifestyle to where you start appreciating and having joy, that mellow constant, and you're not just dictated by the ebbs and flow of the sea that this life can just push us and pull us in, right? And mm -hmm. so we talk about, you know, goals and priorities are so important, but you got to put them in the right areas, and then you've got to have the right perspective. And that kind of leads me into a question that you alluded to and your point you made earlier we know mental health is very real and we know that there are people that have um, chemical imbalances or there's just things that happen that are 100% out of their control. But at what point do people start using mental health as a crutch and an excuse? And we start seeing victim mentality really starting to run rampant. I just like to maybe get your thoughts on that. I will tell you, um, and I'm, I'm going to be, I'll be careful how I say this. Um, but the I, I am discovering that that the younger generations have much more of a tendency towards that um, mental health being a crutch that they they almost want to have it because it gives them some type of victim status or mm -hmm. they they're getting something out of it. I know it's probably not a popular thing to say, and it absolutely is not age based. I'm just noticing a pattern in people that I know in my own life, um, that, that that's definitely, um, something I'm seeing. Um, and I think there's also a whole group of people that are starting to wake up and realize that in order to, that, that their power comes from themselves, um, not from the outside. And so then once they recognize that and kind of shake off that victim mentality, um, I think they tend to do a lot better overall. Um, so I don't know if I really answered your question and I know that's definitely an opinion and not a scientific fact. Um, but, um, that's kind of how I see it. You know, yeah. there's Greg, you, you always say the phrase so eloquently about, and I, I know it's a quote that you've found somewhere. Um, but it's essentially like about the people that struggle, right? So what is it, Greg, soft times make soft men or whatever it is. You've said it before. I can't remember off the top of my head. Do you remember it? 
Yeah, I remember and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna screw it up, but it's something like this fact that like hard times make hard men, soft times make soft men, and it's kind of a cycle that goes around. I, I actually you, you prop me up to say that I had it memorized and I don't, but I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. So, but, so but you do see that cycle where it's almost like let's just say for instance you have an, an individual that's very yeah. strong and powerful. Well, he tends to make the people below him weak because he's he's basically providing for them. Well, then that weak person grows up to be an adult. And because of their weakness, it forces their offspring to have to be tough and grow stronger. And so you see this kind of this cycle and then it's, it's a generalization. Sure. And, and again, not necessarily something that's universal, but. Well, some, the reason I'll bring that up is just because I think that that's there's discussions that I've had in just like circles of, of friend groups and stuff like that is just like talking about what their kids are facing we can relate it back to kids right so like you know maybe some haven't had to struggle as much as their parents did right it just provides for a different like sense of reality so far right so things things that come easy to some people may not come easy to other people and their lives are dramatically altered for better or worse by the experiences that they have so is it a case of you know things have gotten easy because we have started well take that back is it a case of like opportunities have become more abundant for some people. So it seems to come easier so that their lives are a little bit easier. So then they don't struggle as much, you know, or is it, or is it that what I'm trying to get at is like, do people need more struggle in their life? Like, do they need harder things to do versus be more introspective, be more worried about the things that might not matter as much versus going and getting food or, going and you know lifting heavy things to carry it across uh, a chasm to feed their family and stuff like that does that make sense anyone get where i'm going with any of this yeah yeah i get where you're, i get where you're going with it um and I, i'm like in raising my own kids um i i would always play the rebellious child to drive them into the adult roles mm. um and i i was always trying to set up the outcome, not so much. I didn't want to lecture them about things. I wanted them to actually figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, I would tease them, of course, hey, you want to touch the hot stove? And I'd pull them over there and shake and pretend like we're going to touch it. And ah, no, dad, you know, but, um, you know, it was a funny thing when they were younger. But what I did do is like, um, uh, for example, with my my daughter, uh, my second daughter, she's a rescue. I'm kidding. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I always tease her with that, but um, she, <laughs> she uh, wanted to do soccer and all the other kids were, um, their families were paying for them to do soccer. And it was kind of expensive. It was like $500. Like they could have paid for it. That wasn't a problem, um, but she wouldn't have learned anything and she wouldn't have um, got the satisfaction of having earned it. So she, we talked about, okay, what are some potential ways that you could pay for this? And, you know, of course, mow lawns, clean the house. No, 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 let's think outside the box. So what we ended up doing is taking, she had $50 saved up. We took the $50 to Walmart and we bought Lent candy bars. And then she went door to door and sold the candy bars, you know, for like five times what they were worth because she was a yes. cute redhead who would just grin at you. And then would just, people would just give her money. <laughs> and, um, she uh, and she even got her roped her little sister, who was also a cute little redhead in there to uh, to go sell these candy bars. And within about five hours, she'd earned five hundred dollars to pay for soccer. And so for the rest of you know her life, when she was younger, um, she started to do come up with ideas. She even created she had a C-Corp. She had her own employees when she was like 15. And, you know, they come in, they, they were cleaning um uh, clinics and businesses and stuff. And they, uh, she had a whole business that ended up putting her through her first year of college. And she learned all kinds of stuff, all because of not giving her $500 to join soccer and being the mean dad who's doesn't love her. And yet, you know how kids are. And then eventually she's like, thanks for doing that. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> yeah. Christian, that, that's a, that's a really great story. And I think it drives him a good point. And, you know, Sammy, I was thinking when you were asking that question, it's kind of like, you know, on some circumstances, you know, you have children, if we're just going to talk about like the family unit and kids, that come from severe struggles, right? And sure, are there cases of, of those that rise up and, and really excel? But I mean, I can share from just my experience at Vogel Alco working with children that are homeless and, and families that are in extreme poverty, man, that is a major, major challenge and the hurdles mm -hmm. and the long-term difficulties that come from that 
um, it, it's 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 horrible. You yeah. can look at the same side, or excuse me, you can go to the polar opposite, and you find a family that's quote unquote, um, you know, very successful in terms of wealth and opportunity, and it's almost that affluency thing. You give that child everything they need, you spoil them rotten. Well, then they don't develop any of those skills. So it's kind of where's that sweet spot? And I uh -huh. think what a great story, Christian, you just illustrated, where you know you gave your daughter the ability to play soccer. You set that up for. Her, yet you put a condition in place that caused her to have ownership and actually have a learning response to it. So I just, I just wanted to share, I thought that was a great story and, and what a great actionable item that I think people listening to this can learn how to apply that in their lives with their kids. Mm -hmm. I want to go, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, I was just wondering, like some of the things that we've talked about and seen too is a little bit of a divergent, but you know, Greg talked a little bit about the mental health becoming a crutch, like what, it's kind of where we went down this path where there's some recent examples um, here where mental health is really taking the stage, like in the media as well, but some on some very public figures like Simone Biles, um, Calvin Ridley was probably the most uh, recent uh, person that said he needs to kind of go work on his own. And then uh, Naomi Osaka as well. I mean, pulled out of the Olympics in her in her uh, home. Was it like her parents' home country or, or whatever? She's half Japanese, I believe. Um, but wow, like those are some pretty high profile public figures that have a lot of people. So I say this and ask, like, when does it become that? You know, we don't know the the full stories behind all of those too, right? But gosh, where is it? when you're on a team, right. And you're, you're, you're working with a team too. Do you stick it out and like support the team? You know, like, is it, is it considered quitting and giving up on the other people that have been there for you too? You know, like being on a team and, and it's a different aspect than being a solo performer, I guess you can say too. Right. Simone Biles being a little bit different only than like a Calvin Ridley, but just want to know your take on that. Like, what have you seen? Because you're, it, we'll get to the part where you you are, are a jujitsu practitioner as well. I want to learn a little bit more about that. But what is your take from a sports angle on this too? Because um, we're both big sports fans here. I, I want to answer your question by sidestepping it entirely. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> How is that? <laughs> um, I think. So there's a statistic that I like to quote, that, but it's very relevant. So 69% of those that are suffering from a mental health condition do not know that the symptoms they're suffering from are caused by mental health. And so one of the keys to that, and then I'll get to your question, is to screen yourself on a regular basis and be tested. And if that's done well, there's some type of scoring involved. Um, and um, you can monitor progress um, as well. So if somebody is newly discovering that they have a mental health condition or they're just struggling with mental health in general, but they've never actually been screened to find out what's really going on, is this anxiety? Is it somatic symptom disorder? Is it ADHD? Is it bipolar disorder? Mm -hmm. What's actually happening with me? There is an opportunity for that person to actually find out what's going on. So it's not just, I need a mental health day, but it's more like, okay, I'm not feeling good. Something's wrong. I'm feeling um, energy in my chest or my, my thoughts are racing and I can't get them under control. If you actually start to identify those issues as, hey, you've got anxiety and it's severe anxiety um, or you have anxiety and somatic symptom disorder or whatever, um, then the person could start actually getting help. So in the situation with these athletes, I don't know if they had actually been checked for mental health or if they were just having what they considered to be mental health issues. I don't know. I'm not inside their head and I can't right. second get, guess that. I think from a team perspective, it would have been nice for them to have acknowledged that prior to going to the games, but we don't know what actually happened was being at the games. Did it trigger something? Did it trigger mm -hmm. something inside of them? So I have no judgment on whether or not they should or should not have done that. I don't know because I'm not them. And I wouldn't even attempt to try to figure that out. Um, but I can tell you that they need to be screened, they need to be tested, um, and they need to be monitored over time um, so that they're not just floating around freely in the world with an issue that's being unaddressed. It'd be like having um, high blood pressure and never finding out, and then all of a sudden 
you know, your valve explodes in your heart because you're, you didn't treat blood pressure. I mean, it's like, there is no difference between untreated anxiety and untreated hypertension. None. It's, they're both going to kill you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and they're both, if you can find them out with a test, um, and both of them actually have treatments that are effective and actually work. So did I answer your question without answering your question? <laughs> no, I think you gave me a lot to think about there too, because I mean, I want to diverge again a little bit too. So my, my grandmother had severe dementia and I think that's what ultimately uh, ended her life too. It's just her mental health went down so far that, I mean, she didn't even know what was going on. And so that's always been one of the things that I worried about the most is like, okay, is this genetic? I need to get tested. I need to do, you know, start to, to think about that uh, for some long-term understanding of what may be a potential path I may go down in my life. So there was, there's two ways. So one side of my family, it was always heart attacks or strokes. I mean, that was one way we're going. The other side of the family seems to be more of the mental health issue too. So I got to pick my poison here. So I got super fit and healthy and trying to do my best and I've got that under control. Now it's like really time to understand my mental health and really understand like what I can do to get better at, 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 at understanding it, but then also being proactive. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of those things that, that people can do um, to understand their mental health. And you talked about doing the test. I'd like to, for you to talk to a little bit about your test, but then also like, what are some of the things that you know from a scientific perspective that people can start doing now that has, people have seen some results in helping to address mental health issues that they have. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, when you said that you have two divergent tracks in your family, one's heart attack and one's mental health, those are the same path because mm-hmm. those conditions are connected to each other. We, it's called comorbid. They're comorbid to each mm-hmm. other. Um, one, we don't know cause and effect, which drives which, but if you're depressed, your, your chances of having a heart attack go up exponentially. Right. Um, I think the stat is if you've actually had a heart attack and you have depression, um, you're 300% more likely to have a second event. Wow. Um, and by the way, the remember me telling you the story earlier about the anxiety and the suicide and mm-hmm. the doctor calling me up. Um, that was actually Dr. Amy Donine from the Bale Donine method for heart attack, stroke, and diabetes prevention. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've, they've embedded the tool in there in the Bale Donine method. Um, for the psychosocial aspects of heart attack and stroke. So they're super connected to each other. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, I probably went down. I can't remember the rest of your question. <laughs> no, I just, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your test because you, you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, like getting a test, right? To, to kind of mm-hmm. almost get like a baseline, right? Understand. Yep. So yep. talk a little bit about your test. I've got it up here on the other monitor here and I took the test and I, I looked through and, and one of my things that I looked at, I took this on the first actually of November and I was pretty relieved I, I should say like I, I'm in all the all green um Good. and um low risk and pretty much everything that's on this test but I'd love to for you to just talk a little bit about the test you developed yeah so um what we did is we we realized that doctors remember the stat about 69 percent don't know they have a mental health condition most mental health gets caught in primary care doctor's office family practice internal medicine OBGYN, and pediatrics so that's where most of it people don't get caught in the psychiatrist's office by the time you go to the psychiatrist's office they already know you have a problem um and that's not a law but that's a general truth um So um, because it's mostly caught in primary care doctor's office, they are super swamped. They're seeing 20 to 50 patients a day in extreme cases. Um, They don't have a lot of time to be testing. So they end up doing what's what we call the fishing pole approach, which is uh, you might be depressed. Let me give you a PHQ-9, which is the name of the test that they give you. It's um, a little paper-based test usually, or you might have anxiety. Let me give you this GAD-7. Um, the problem is you can't tell if somebody has got a mental health issue by having a two minute conversation with them and looking at them. Maybe if they're in extreme distress, you might pick up on it, but most of the time you won't matter of fact, there's another statistic that kind of proves the point, which is that 45% uh, of those that actually commit suicide were in the primary care doctor's office less than 30 days before they killed themselves. That's cough and colds. That's hypertension. That's you know, all kinds of different things. That's not just a mental health problem that they had. So primary care doctors just, they're missing people. And 
So we built our tool to take the approach like fishing with a net. We just throw the net in the water and we see what fish come back. And because mental health is a spectrum, it's absolutely critical that it's done this way. And we balanced the need to have speed with detail. So we picked the six most common connected conditions that are affecting physical medicine, that are affecting diabetes, hypertension, all those things we talked about. And we test for those. We could test for every condition that exists, but the problem is, is that it would take you an hour to take the test Mm -hmm. and you can't do it. it. It's not realistic. So we made the choice that we are boxing these in. These are the six conditions we're going to test for and we will not no matter who asks us no matter what's going to we're not going to expand that out with some rare exceptions um but um the uh the reason for that is because as soon as you start doing that people stop using it so we found this balance um and we're able to test most people in under a minute um so and we can rule out um if they have a mental health condition or if they don't have a mental health condition we can rule them out with a 96.4 percent negative predictive power meaning less than four percent are going to slip through the cracks um and then we have a second level to the test that's using a, a branching logic engine and we're testing actually doing a full assessment for just the conditions that they triggered in the first part of the test And that means that they're not answering a whole bunch of redundant extra questions and they're only answering relevant questions. And we're trying to rule that condition out as fast as we can. If we can't rule it out, then we want as much detail as we possibly can. So is your depression caused by life events or bereavement? Do you have alcohol or drugs issues? Is there some kind of physical illness that's um, partially why you feel the way you feel. What do you meet the DSM five criteria, which is the standard criteria for that condition. Um, and then what's your score? So we can track you longitudinally. So today you're a 60, but we put you on this medication or had, you know, got, you got cognitive behavioral therapy. And now all of a sudden you're, you're down to 40 or whatever. Mm. Um, so we have all those pieces, um, in there for the doctors to see all this, like at a snapshot, really super fast. Green is good, red is bad, your eyes are drawn to the red, so you're not wasting your time on stuff that's irrelevant. And then the last thing is that doctors typically only check for suicidality um, if they check for depression. But the fact is you're just as likely to commit suicide from bipolar disorder or anxiety as you are from depression. And so we actually check for suicide risk regardless of what you trigger. And if you do actually trigger additional suicide questions, we look for ideation, risks. Do you have a plan? Do you have intent? So that the the doctor is not needing to have a promotional conversation in the exam room. They know already what's going on. And then we adapted all of this during COVID because we realized that with the doctor so focused on COVID, they were not checking people for mental health. And yet, if I showed you our statistics, anxiety is off the charts. It's the highest numbers I've ever seen. It's like in the 70% on some of the internal um, checks that we've done. And um, suicide rates used to be like 1% or suicide plan and intent used to be like 1%. It was 17% on one and 16% on the other one that we, the little internal study that we did. Um, It's insane what's going on. So the people need help. So we built the individual version Um, for folks, we didn't know how to monetize it. We figured karma would sort it out on the back end. We just got to get this out into the hands of people. So we obviously, we can't give people the level of detail that a doctor would get. It's just, it's not appropriate. Um, so we, we have this gas gauge, you know, for your risk, green is good. Red is bad. If you have a risk, it's going to more close to red. Um, then you can take that result to your doctor who can convert it to a full clinical version at no charge to get you the help that you need. Um, And then we have mental health resources. We've started to partner with groups. So we're gonna be adding a second page that gives people um, suggestions and information about the conditions and things like that. Um, And then in doing all that, we were approached by a bunch of companies and schools saying, hey, um, we love what you're doing, but how can we find out what's going on with our, our overall population? And so that's how we figured out ultimately how to monetize it is we don't charge for the test itself. We do on the healthcare side because it's billable to insurance and doctors make a lot of money from it. Um, But on the the corporate side and the education side, um, the testing's free. It will always be free. Um, But we charge for this little aggregate report and it's it's a modest amount. It's almost nothing. Um, 
And that allows them to see the overall aggregate view of their whole company, of their school. Um, and um, then they know, like, if, if I want to institute, say, mindfulness training or something, um, and because people have severe anxiety in the, in the organization, then they can measure whether or not it's actually working because they can go back and do retests and they never get to see the results of the, te of the test. The only the person taking it gets it. I mean, it is absolutely ironclad anonymous. We don't track anything, no cookies, nothing. Mm. Um, and so that way it's totally safe for individuals. Um, and then they can see the aggregate view, um, of that. So, um, that that's pretty much the company in a nutshell. Yeah, Kristen, could you go through what were the six categories that you test for? Depression, anxiety, ADHD, somatic symptom disorder, which is on the spectrum with anxiety, um, bipolar disorder. If you're if you have depression, um, we can turn it on, so we test for it every time, but most most time we leave that off. Um, and then substance use disorder, which. If you, if you have substance use disorder and you're dealing with anxiety or depression, you're never going to solve that problem until you deal with the substance use disorder because it's driving those problems. And so often people, again, don't know they have a problem. So what do they do? They self-medicate mm -hmm. because they, they can't deal with what's going on with themselves. And it's, I mean, it's something that's super extremely common. Matter of fact, I personally believe that it's about 10 times more common than we even know. Mm -hmm. Um, just that then I know there's studies out and everything like that, but I think it's way worse than people actually realize. Well, I, so. I don't have any science to back up what I'm about to say. So it's more of my gut or just kind of what I see and feel. Um, but I think we live in, again, in a society that self-medication has just become our go-to treatment for the, the ails and challenges of life. And I think the other issue, and Sammy and I talk about this, and we brought this up on other podcasts is again, if you look at, it kind of goes back to the whole pursuit of growth. We talk about, about having your life and your purpose pointed in the right direction, but you know, the typical person, it seems to be they're pursuing comforts, right? We talked earlier about status and wealth and those type of things, but they're seeking to set their life up with comfort and the fear of losing that when they don't have, kind of goes back to how you tied it in Christian with, with the, the lack of resilience and coping skills it's just a recipe for disaster. And then what happens, you start getting people self-medicating on top of that. And it just becomes a hurricane of just everything that we've talked about. Um, I say all that and, you know, I kind of transition a little bit. I want to give kind of a personal plug um, for Connected Mind. Vogel Alcove, which is the organization that I work for, we serve homeless children and homeless families. And on our family support side, when our parents enroll in our program, our family support team and caseworkers actually administer Connected Mind, the, the assessment to our families. And I actually talked to them today and they were like, it's incredible. It's such an unbelievable, helpful tool that allows them to be able to help and refer our families to you know, the help they may need. Because again, these families are coming from a variety of traumatic experiences and it's one of the requirements of being able to utilize our free service for them is that they take this assessment and let us point them in the right direction. And so it's been a game changer. That's fantastic. I would love at some point to, um, to get your employees on the, um, the corporate version as well, because I think it yeah. can make a big, big impact um, on them um, having that internal resource. It's obviously different than the one that you're using um, for the, the families. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's the anonymous version, but it, it could make a big impact. Well, and, and and talk about that a little bit more. You talked about the uh, you know this being a tool that corporations could be able to see an aggregate and then use that as um, as an opportunity to pour into their workforce and their culture on hey these are the things that we want to work for. Mm -hmm. Where do you see is that going to be kind of a big next step for the is really seeing how you can get this into small businesses, large corporations, to just kind of the corporate world. So we realize that for this to work, we have got to hit mental health from every single possible angle, and we need to collaborate with as many people as we possibly mm -hmm. can. And so really our strategy for growth is um, integrations. So to be embedded, whether they see it as connected mind or whether it's a white label of our tool, but to be embedded inside of other products. And we've already started that process. We're embedded in a few tools right now. We're starting to... Um, excuse me, get a lot of um, folks approaching us um, to be embedded in much larger products. So within 
a very short period of time, you're going to start seeing this everywhere. I mean, it's out, it's all over the place now, but it's going to be exponentially more out there um, pretty soon. But um, we can't do this alone. And one of our core values, so our, our core values in the company are integrity. And when I say integrity, I don't mean honesty. I mean, alignment, meaning being in alignment. Um, so integrity, simplicity, generosity, and collaboration. So those actually drive our company because we know that without an enrolled community collaborating to solve this problem, we can't, we just simply can't do it. I, I'm taking it back. It, it, there's a lot, I've, I've heard Greg talk a lot about it with the families too. I mean, my, you know, I used to work with Bogo Alcove too, and the impact of stress and trauma, especially on a young kid's brain, I look at it from all aspects. I mean, even, you know, being up here, I live in a, in a, in a nice neighborhood up in Frisco, you know, it's, I see kind of what my kids are going through and like, you know, understanding that they could have it way worse, but don't minimize the impact of whatever they're going through as well. It's something that I reframe myself with a lot of times whenever they're having a challenging day. Cause I've used that card before. It's like, Hey, you know, there's other kids that are going through X, Y, Z, but to my kids, this is their yeah, biggest. That kid, that, that, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. that, that, they don't have that that perspective. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, you you got to be present, um, you know, with people because you remember how you talked about where do we fit in the spectrum? Do we see it as a problem? Do we not see it as a problem? Is there somewhere in the middle? The fact is, is that um, if you can just get present, you can tell. Like, and when I work with uh, combat vets, right? Um, we, we teach them jujitsu as a way of dealing with trauma. The worst thing that you could do is like baby them. They do not want to be baby. But if you were to treat, say, I don't know, a 15 year old, um, the same way you treat the vet, they would break down in a pool of tears, mm -hmm. but the vet needs you to be a little bit rougher with them or else they're not going to respect you. And they actually want you to tease them and poke at them and things like you can't do that to the kid. Right. So it's, you got to be present and really just feel which way you're being led um, with that person and, and just be sensitive to, you know, where, where they're at and hearing them and just, just asking for help to know which direction to take it. That's kind of how I always play it. I just get real quiet and I just try to listen um, and then go from there. Yeah, I, I think that's a, an excellent point, Christian. It's kind of the whole, the, the, the old adage of like, you've got to meet somebody where they're at. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one of the things that I really work on myself with is just ask questions and then listen Yeah. and, yeah. and, and, and build trust and go from there. And this is kind of a little bit of a transition, um, actually in, in terms of growth and just the whole pursuit of growth and what Sam and I are about kind of switching the conversation from connected mind to you. And so one of the things that I love, and, and I, I've known you personally now for several years, and even in preparation for this interview, reading some information about you that I found online, I know that you have a business coach, Ken Stibler, that Sam and I both work very, very closely with as well. And he's been on the show as well. And he's been on the show as well, which is a terrible episode, just a horrible episode. Stibs. Um, right. <laughs> the Stibs. But I was interested to read that you also have a life coach. And so I, I would love for you, Christian, to share a little bit about what your life coach and your business coach have meant to you. And, you know, what have the results been of those experiences? Yeah, I do have a life coach. Her name is Lori Link. And um, at this point, you know, I've been with her for, God, it's been like 15 or 16 years. So we're more friends now than coach, coach and coachy, whatever you want yeah. to call it. <laughs> but um, um, she, she's really been amazing for me. And she has worked definitely more on the, the me side of things, whereas Ken is more the business side of things. Um, you know, helping me set up structure and legal and, you know, uh, pushing through adversity and difficulties in the business and, you know, that type of thing. Whereas Lori is, is more, um, you know, taught me about myself um, and making my own internal pursuit of growth, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the, the key points that she taught me took me probably five years to actually uh, truly absorb what she said which was be, do, have, instead of have, do, be, meaning be who you are, be who you want to be first. 
so often what we do is we work ourselves to death to try to have a car so that we can be happy, so that we can be nice to our family and have a good relationship with our wife. Well, do, you can be nice to your family and have a good relationship with your wife right now. The car is going to come if you're in alignment. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So she taught me that and it's, it's really changed my life, especially when I lost everything. So, um, you know, that was extremely traumatic, a very dark time, um, but also a time of extreme growth for me. And then brought me to a place that I didn't even know you could have so much joy and happiness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, wow, where's this been my whole life? <laughs> but, um, you know, she helped me navigate through that a lot. So, and then of yeah. course, Stibler helped me navigate through it from the business side of things, which he is very much a life coach too. So mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like he's a cold-hearted, ruthless bastard, but he is. No, I'm <laughs> <He> kidding. Is. <laughs> I love you, Ken. All right. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. So, so well, it, you said B of... do have. So what's the do in the is that I mean... so so you be who you're gonna be, which yep. generates the actions because you want to be in alignment. And then those actions end up creating the having. Mm-hmm. Where so often we try to scramble around to have stuff so that we can do the things that we know we're supposed to do finally. And then eventually we'll be the person we want to be. We, everybody has it backwards so often Mm -hmm. because people, um, and you said people are out for comfort. I would challenge that just a little bit. I think people are out to escape. Mm -hmm. I think people are out to hide from themselves, um, because they don't like themselves. (laughs) Um, and they never spent any time alone with themselves. And so if people, can be alone with themselves. And I said this when I was talking before on Julian's show, um, just shut up mm-hmm. for five mm-hmm. minutes. Don't say anything. Just listen, just listen, just sit there and listen. And you'll be shocked how you start to know yourself. I like that. Christian, elaborate a little bit on, you mentioned that, you know, when you had the life coach talk to you about be do have it was still kind of a five-year period I think you said of really that growth and kind of really absolutely adopting that can you talk a little bit about that journey and how did what were some of the the tactical things that you did to get to where you truly believe that and you embrace it now as opposed to just hearing a great saying and being like that sounds really cool I wish I could do it um the, the the best way I could explain it was I kept trying to figure it out for five years. And I was too scared to face myself um, and listen and be quiet. um, Because I was afraid that if I was if I didn't keep the hamster wheel rolling, that the sun wouldn't come up the next day. (laughs) Yeah. And so when I lost everything, literally, I lost my business, every dime that I had and my family, my wife, (laughs) Mm -hmm. at the time. Um, And all of it was like, boom, boom, boom. And then I'm sitting there on my ass and a pile of dirt going, oh crap, now what do I do? And you know, the first thing that came up in my head was, huh, well, this is pretty freeing. Now I don't have to impress anybody. They all know I'm a failure. This is awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So then I was like, well, let me work on that being, be, do, have thing that I've been trying to figure out for so long. And so I started meditating. I started taking very long walks. Um, I started, I, I wouldn't say that I tried to figure it out in my mind and come up with plans. I just started listening. Um, like and then that. remembering like, you know, so my personal vision and mission is be free and bring freedom. So that's my vision and my mission. So everything in my whole life points towards that. And so I still just started to just ponder on that, but not ponder on it, like trying to figure it out, but more just go, huh, that's pretty interesting. I see this in all these areas of my life, you know, just the curiosity started to come back up again. And then little by little, um, I stopped being like, you know, (laughs) murderously angry for losing everything and started realizing what a blessing it was. And then started the process of, okay, now um, I'm going to write down what, what the perfect woman in my life looks like. Mm -hmm. And all the things I want her to be not, I didn't say, you know, she's got to have blue eyes and blonde hair and, you know, Jimmy Choo shoes. I was like, what kind of character does this woman Mm -hmm. have? Mm -hmm. And I started really working on the laws of attraction. So 
Um, if I want these things in my life, if I want to be free, you know, then just be free and watch what starts coming to you. Yeah. And so it started to happen. And then of course I met my wife, Justine, which is just a miracle from heaven. She is the most wonderful woman. I didn't even know anyone like her ever could even exist. Is it, <laughs> so, fair, is it, is it fair to say she's too good for you? Oh, she's way too good for me. <laughs> I'll just follow and, her around like a puppy dog. <laughs> and Sammy and I, obviously for those listening, Sammy and I both know Justine very well. And she, yeah. she is truly amazing. Yeah, she's she's really on a, a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But that, I mean, and then when she came into my life, all of a sudden I started to have a new relationship with money because she was so zenned out about it, you know? And I was always you know, and I, I've had plenty of money in my life, believe me. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was this weird relationship with, and that started to change. And then my relationship with generosity started to change and my relationship with my kids and family started to change. And it was like, wow. Um, it's just alignment, you know, without integrity, nothing works without alignment, nothing mm -hmm. works. But once you start to find what you want and, um, with your life, then it just all starts to just click and whenever things aren't clicking that's the first thing i go back to who am i being right now because if this isn't working who am i being what what's going on am i not being present am i not you know like what's going on here and i kind of pause and breathe and get present again you know in the, in the book uh the pursuit of growth i documented going back about 15 years ago when i had kind of my nervous breakdown and my rock bottom moment and one of the exercises that I did at the time, because I had developed this kind of habit of when, when I was really upset about something, I'd write it down. And, and I, get, I get some kind of weird therapy out of just like writing my thoughts down. And I made a list. And on one side of my legal pad, I wrote just all the things that I was ashamed about my life. And just why I'm so upset, why I'm so depressed, why I'm so anxious, why I'm so fearful. And it was actually very therapeutic just to get it all out on paper. But then the next thing I did was I asked myself, and it kind of goes back to what you said, well, who is it that I want to be? And what, what, what could I write down over here that if I was today, I wouldn't have these feelings, I wouldn't have these thoughts. And I started that writing down the person that I wanted to become. And then I realized, okay, well, there's nothing that's stopping me from going from who I am right now in this depressed, overly anxious, having a mental breakdown moment to this person over here. But I do need to put a plan in place. So I love how you talked about like, what's the type of woman that I wanna be with? Well, that was something that I wrote down as well. What are the type of people I wanna surround myself with? What is the type of job that I wanna have? All these things that I can be, right? And then the whole pursuit of growth was the transformation to go from that to there. And so uh, really not a question with that, but just kind of just sharing kind of a similar story of just, you know, when you hit rock bottom, it's amazing when you feel like you lost it all, it's not really as bad as you really thought with the right perspective. I love what you're saying. And I think it's important to point out, and, and if I'm saying this wrong, please correct me. But when a lot of times when we hear make a plan to be something or change, a lot of people hear like, okay, first I have to climb Mount Everest. Then I have to, you know, yeah. jump over this and I have to write six books. And make, I think at least for me, and it sounds like for you also making the plan was to just notice what you actually wanted. Mm -hmm. it, it's not there. And then the doing part just kind of happens by itself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, you take actions, but it's in alignment with the fact that that's actually what you actually want. Yeah. And if you're ruthlessly honest with yourself and you actually do want it, you kind of do it because you want it. <laughs> I, I, Sammy and I both talk about this is, I mean, there's certain things in life that we have very detailed structured plans of how we're going to go from here to here. Most things in life and most change and most, most growth happens from just identifying and making a decision. Yep. The choice. The choice. And then say, you know what, now it's time to go for it. And, and it can be yeah. as simple as that. It's like you talked about earlier, simplicity. And one of the three things you talked about, make things simple, people, and it's amazing what you can do. You know, yeah. part of the part, part of the thing too about the book is, is, is something that Greg and I have, have talked a lot about, and it's repeated in every single chapter of the book is the way to go about the plan, like the steps, right? Because I think some people also, they find themselves in a place where they don't even know where to start, right? Mm -hmm. and, and some yeah. people are also too afraid to ask for help. And so they have to, number one, be present with themselves for sure. But then number two, like, 
we wrote this to hopefully be able to give somebody an easy to follow methodology mm-hmm. of something that worked for two, what we say all the time, we're normal people. We feel like we're normal people, right? Well, Greg's so, not normal, but yeah, you are, yeah. Sammy. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, working on it. Um, but uh, on, on Thursdays and Fridays, I'm okay. Right, yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing is like, we wanted it, this to be like a, a roadmap. And that's why we talked about a, road, a roadmap or a lifestyle to flourish in today's world, because yeah, it's not going to work. You're not going to have to utilize every single step for all the time. Like sometimes it's just creating the plan and under, or understanding that you want a plan. It's enough to get you sparked and going too. So that's something that we were very intentional on and, and something I'm very intentional on too in, in, in all my daily happenings. Yeah, and, and just to, to, awesome. to add one thing to what Sammy said is, you know, when we talk about these steps and these plans, it's not necessarily like writing down these really hard details things, but it's stuff like accountability. So you, you've got this change you want to make in your life. You've got this place you want to go. Who can you go to to team up with and say, hey, this is something that I'm working on. I'd like you to be my accountability partner, right? Like that's a step in the plan. So again, I, I like how you kind of brought up, Chris, and the idea that in many cases, and, and when you hear the word plan, different people can have different connotations of what that means. And to Sammy and I's point, I, I like how Sammy said this, it's a roadmap. It's basically just pointing you in the right direction. And here's some just actionable things that you can actually do that are going to go well for you. And it makes it easy for you to kind of stay in alignment. And like we say, it's hard to get lost on a straight road. So <laughs> use the straight road. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's awesome. I suppose at yeah. some point I should probably read your book. <laughs> you know what? I tell you what, I'll send you a copy and I would love to get your thoughts and feedback on it. Are you on Audible yet? Not yet, but we're working on it. Working on okay. it. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I usually, I would love a hard copy, of course, but I usually listen to all my books and I usually listen on two times speed. So well, it I'll helps me I'll, pay I'll, attention. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Christian, for you, I'll make you a deal. Um, I'll sit outside your window every night for about 15 minutes. I'll read very quickly <laughs> and then I'll head home. So we'll, we'll, we'll just do a personalized approach for you. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. I'll keep the dogs from barking. <laughs> the, the trauma of his face outside your window with the boom box. <laughs> <laughs> may it's cause more harm journey and reading the pursuit of growth <laughs> yes well hey speaking of books christian i know you're you're an avid uh i guess audible listener yep tell us a few books that have actually that you think you've listened to or you've read that you would say man those books really impacted my life oh there are so many i know you're gonna put me on the spot with this yeah <laughs> I have- how about just the first two that come to your mind? Make it a little bit easier. So not your favorite, just the first two that come to your mind. Yeah, so I, I would say, um, well, the four-hour work week was extremely impactful for me. On the business side for managing teams, a team of teams by Stan McChrystal is an absolute must. Um, the, it is, go ahead. I was going to say the four-hour work week, that's Tim Ferriss, correct? Tim Ferriss, correct. Yeah. Yep. And then on the science side, um, Incognito, The Secret Lives of the Brain. Um, was fantastic. The biology of belief um, was really good as well. And then on the trauma side, which we're not doing trauma tests, but um, the, when the, the body keeps score, uh, the score, um, when the body says no and white tiger um, or the seminal works on trauma and um, how trauma affects autoimmune disease and all kinds of different things, which is super interesting to me because it's all connected. Trauma is more of the the why and the depression, anxiety, and those are more of the what, the That's symptoms the behind it. And then the why you have those additional symptoms. And, but of course, trauma has its own symptoms as well. But um, that was very helpful for me. Um, and then um, I, I loved from the fictional side, um, just read um, uh, Islands of the Damned about World War II and the Marine Corps in the Pacific which was really interesting because the guy who wrote it, and I cannot remember his name, it's RK something, was uh, actually lived in Irving, which is where I live. So, okay. and met some people that met him. So it was kind of an interesting thing. So, but yeah, there's a few books that shot, shot at you real quick. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we're definitely going to be linking those up. I, we're been in talks for, to create our own Pursuit of Growth library. Uh, oh, because sweet. I think there's so many different books that have impacted my life, Greg's life, everyone, our guest's life and, and all of our circles around. I, I'd love to have that at least listed somewhere that people can listen to them or, or read them as they, as they please. Um, one other one I'd like to add in, this is a weird book and you really have to get past 
what's going on to get under the covers of it because it's just the way it's done is really weird. Um, but it's the laws of attraction um, was really a good book. Um, and it, it took me a while because I was really turned off by the, the way that they did the book, but I got past it pretty quick. I've actually listened to it like three or four times. So do you recall who the author is of, of that particular book? Uh, Esther and Hicks, some Esther Hicks and somebody else Hicks. Yeah, we it's can, an we, old book. It's yeah, very we can, old. We can go back and we'll find it and we'll link it and we'll include it in yeah. the title. But, you know, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'm a person of faith and I absolutely believe in the law of attraction and, mm. uh, and, there, and, and all those different types of things. But, you know, from a biblical standpoint, a very similar law that's talked about, it's not named this in the Bible. It's been, it's been framed this afterwards, but it's the law of the harvest. And it's you reap what you sow. So, yeah. And there's just so much in life. And it really actually adds up really nicely kind of to the law of attraction in terms of just the way you go about living your life. And you know what? If, if you plant corn, don't be surprised when you grow corn. Um, yeah. If you're really excited about planting corn, get really excited because you're probably going to grow corn, right? <laughs> and exactly. so uh, it, it's just a different type of mindset. It's simple, but I'm telling you, the, the universe is aligned in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Truth is truth, no matter where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. so. Even though, even though we may disagree on what truth is these days, there's only one truth and it may take us yeah. a little bit to get there, but, but, but yeah. the truth is there. Yeah. Um, yep. Well, Hey, I, Sammy, I wanted to, uh, to take a little bit of time because we got to talk about mixed martial arts Yeah. Yeah. and we've got to talk about jujitsu and man, you are just a fascinating guy just in all aspects of your life. And I think when we first met, Actually, no, it may have been maybe our third or fourth meeting um, that you and I actually started talking about MMA and mixed martial arts and jiu-jitsu. I had no idea that you trained. I had no idea that you taught. So would love to hear kind of the background. How did you get introduced to jiu-jitsu? And tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming an instructor. Yeah. Um, so I started out, um, first of all, I was born at a very young age. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I started out in, um, Tong Sudo when I was 12, um, and did that for about five years. And, um, which is interesting because the reason I did Tong Sudo is that I saw the karate kid and I was convinced that that was the best way to go. Okay. <laughs> and so, so then, um, which was weird because we had like a world-class judo school in Spokane where I grew up. And eventually, um, my uncle who did judo just wiped the floor with me one day, just, he didn't hurt me, but he just beat me from across the room. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I just spent five years learning this martial art and I didn't even get one single move in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he, uh, I was you convinced gotta, at that point, you, you got to go Cobra Kai and sweep the leg, man. That's right. right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, uh, I, I joined judo. I started training judo. Um, and by the way, judo and jujitsu, they're basically the same thing. Um, it's just one, it's the focus is different. One's more stand up and less ground and one's more ground and less stand up. But now they're kind of all half the judo guys are doing jujitsu and half the <laughs> jujitsu guys yeah. do judo. So, um, but uh, during that, um, I, I started taking that and, and it was pretty, pretty Awesome. And then I also took um, Aikijitsu, which is like Aikido, basically joint mm -hmm. manipulations and stuff. And then um, Jiu Jitsu um, showed up in Spokane in like 2001. And I think the highest ranking guy in the whole state was a purple belt. And that was my instructor. So, of course, I, you know, he was incredible. And I had a brown belt in judo and he just beat the stuffings out of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, okay, I got to switch again. <laughs> so, uh, started in 2001 and then I got my black belt in uh, well, August 2015 I'm um, this Friday I actually get my second stripe um, you wow. get a stripe like, yeah thank you thank you but I love it I say jits for life judo is pretty hard on the body um, and you can't do it your whole life without being just mangled um, but jujitsu you really can you can you can adjust your style um, it's very much more technical of a sport um and uh, I can use all my Aikijitsu in there. I can use all my judo. I can use uh, it's fantastic. So everyone calls me a dirty wrist locker because I tap more people out using wrist locks that they didn't know were coming. So they're on top of me. 
and they think they're winning and the next thing you know they're wrist locked and they're like ah! <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well I, I can agree with you about mixed martial arts being hard of the body when i turned 40 um i, I started doing krav maga and a lot of emphasis in muay thai that's really what i loved was just doing a lot of muay thai and man i, I still love it but it beat the crap out of me and oh yeah course, krav is brutal <laughs> yeah and of course sammy every time i would see christian he would tell me that he would just take me down and just submit me and that uh that i needed to learn jiu-jitsu which uh he, he's absolutely right he would take me down every time and submit me um, unless we're in a bar and i've got sammy there and then and then christian takes me to the ground and i can have sammy running and save me so that's about the only that's not the only way that I'm going to win on that one. <laughs> I'll stop the eye poke with my little hand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's fun. And I've got to do a lot of cool stuff with it. I got to help train the Collin County County SWAT team, the Collin County jailers, mm. um, teaching them defensive tactics. Um, I've got, you know, I have my, obviously I teach class on Wednesday nights at rogue jujitsu. Um, and then my instructors at tier one up in McKinney. Um, and so um, I get to go all over the place. I've been all over the world and done jujitsu, did jujitsu in Okinawa, um, done jujitsu all over the place. So, um, wow. they didn't have jujitsu when I went to Vietnam though, they had some kind of weird Kung Fu. And so I couldn't find anywhere to fight, <laughs> but <laughs> I have a feeling that it wouldn't have been a very fair. <laughs> so, but well, uh, I have yeah. a feeling you're probably twice as big as most of the folks you would have found in Vietnam. So that, that gonna, was my they're, point. <laughs> they're not <gonna> <laughs> discrepancy that you face in that uh, in that yeah, just pick them up and throw them on the ground <laughs> hey don't underestimate the small guy man we're cool that's right and Dom, you guys scare the hell out of me that's for sure yeah Fight i don't mess with the little guys either yeah <laughs> well I, I told sammy the guys that i fear the tall skinny guys with the long legs and the long arms man oh yeah those guys frighten me well you better learn to be uh scared of the old fat gray-haired guys because we're the ones that do dirty stuff <laughs> Christian, I've, if there's one thing that I've learned from mixed martial arts is I have a healthy respect of everybody now. Yeah, yeah. And, for, and for, you, for never people, know. you never know. <laughs> and for people that think you're the tough guy in the bar or the tough guy in your neighborhood, all it takes is just getting hit one time for yeah. you to realize, man, this is not fun anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? The guys really that you should watch out for are the ones that are smiling and have a great attitude and don't puff up their chest or push uh -huh. you. Those are the deadly ones every <laughs> time. <laughs> God, that is the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they don't have anything to prove to you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, so awesome. Well, that this has been an amazing conversation. I mean, I, I, I know we barely scratched the surface on, on top and we say this all the time because it's the time that we spend together is just not enough. Like, so we would love to be able to, to come back and loop back around with you and, and talk a little bit more deep dive, understand a little bit more about what you're doing, understand a little bit more about why Krav Maga is better than jujitsu, according to Greg, um, <laughs> not according to me. Um, but, um, you know, we'd love to have you back on again to just talk about some of those different things. But as we wind down this episode, one of the things that we always love to do is ask two specific questions of all of our guests. And, and I'll take the first one, Greg, and then I'll, I'll let you um, take the second one. Yeah. So the first one is kind of a, a tangible question here is, what first enters your mind when we ask the following question? So the question is, what is a favorite actionable tip, method, or routine, or something that you've learned in life in terms of self-development and growth that you can share with us to help our audience? Breathe, pause, get present, just listen. I'm breathing, I'm pausing. And you're I'm talking and, I, and, and, I, and I'm writing this down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, we did a interview with a woman named Melissa Marks. I was about to say the same uh, thing. I know her. She's you wonderful. Know Melissa? She's wonderful. And we, uh, we had a whole discussion on breathing mm -hmm. and just, it's the most basic thing in our lives. We do it without thinking about it yet. When you do it intentionally, it can have one of the biggest impacts in terms of our health and wellness and our well-being. I love that you said that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, the second question is, so you've, you've been asked a million times, if you could go back 10 years ago, what advice would you give yourself? Well, we have a different version of that question. So let's say you could go into the future 10 years. And so to give you kind of a, a way we're going to do that today, 
we're going to put together a time capsule. So we're going to ask you, Christian, to write down a piece of advice, and then we're going to bury it in the backyard. And in 10 years, we're going to pick that time capsule up and open it up. What piece of advice would you put in that time capsule for you to read 10 years from now? I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. Um, that's exactly backwards from, <laughs> from the normal question. Yeah. Um, I would say, remember the journey. Mm. Go back, just think about where you've been. Remember the journey. Well, Christian, I'm going to remember this journey. This was a fantastic conversation. And this is actually my favorite part of every episode that we record. And this is the part where Sammy and I take a look at our notes and we stall a little bit because we try to figure out what are three key takeaways that we can present. Typically I cheat and I do like nine or 10 um, every episode, but I promised Sammy a while back that I would keep it to three um, because that's what we agreed to. So I'm going to try to figure out what three key t- takeaways I'm going to share. Sammy, do you want to go first? Let's so, we'll just ping pong back and forth. Typically what happens, Christian, is, is I steal one of his, he steals one of mine, and then we go back and forth and we scavenge all of our notes that we have to get an answer. But I'll start first and I'll take one of the, the key takeaways that I've had so far. It's, I mean, it goes back to something we talked about from the very start of this episode, which was the connections of friends and family are key. And my actionable item out of that is to develop and focus those relationships with the people and expand that network, but make sure that I'm not, I'm doing it very intentionally. I love that. You said a quote when we were talking earlier about interaction with, with children. And you said, I would play the rebellious child to drive them into adult roles. I just love that. And I think about the young people in my life, I'm going to start putting that in a little bit more practice. That's fantastic. Second one that I have is, is more of just a, a footnote for people is we spend a lot, I know personally, I do too, we spend a lot of time on time and money and, and resources on trying to get healthy from a physical perspective, right? What's the, uh, how many gym memberships are sold on, on January 1st, right? To, to New Year's resolutions. But I implore everyone to get a baseline test for mental health. So find one of those because we, we, we can see a physical change right we can see where we need to go but we can't see inside so find a test i'd love for them to go to connected minds and and we'll get to website here uh, shortly but go get a baseline mental health test love that resilience and coping skills so we talked about that in context with children but i'm even just thinking of me personally how can i continue to grow in those two categories my resilience my coping skills because We live in a world that it's always gonna come at us. And how are we practicing and growing in our resilience? How are we practicing our coping skills and how are we using that to serve other people? Love that conversation. And my last takeaway is it's a combination of three different things. It's be present, be sensitive and hear them. And I think that's something that that works across any age group, any demographic. And then my third one, it's also three things. Be, do, have. And uh, Christian, with your permission, I'm going to frame that conversation. I'll link it back to this episode, but I would love to use your story in a blog um, that I'm going to send out into the pursuit of growth. And I just want to capture that story about what you mentioned and what in terms it means to be, do, have. And I love how you said you can be right now. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. that's something that um, I think more people need to hear. That's something, quite honestly, I needed to hear. Really good. Awesome. Wow. It's fantastic, guys. Yeah, this was so much fun. And so I'm still you know, taking as, notes. As, as we kind of wrap things up, my mind is, is still kind of just, uh, you know, going all over the place. But Christian, tell us where can people reach you? Tell us a little bit about where they can go online and learn more about Connected Mind. Um, and if they wanted to follow you personally on LinkedIn or, or any social media you have, where can people get a hold of you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, just my name, Christian Lehinger. There's only one of me in the whole world, so it's easy to find. Um, 
And then uh, um, as far as the company goes, connectedmind.me. Um, and if you want to take the test, just click on individual and screen now. Um, you can also uh, find us on our link tree at link tree. I can't remember what the end is dot something. <laughs> it's <laughs> slash it's, connected mind. <laughs> L-I-N. It's link tr dot e e slash connected mind. So link Thank tree you. slash connected mind. And I'll link <laughs> all this go. up in the in the yep. notes and, and all that too. Awesome. And that has links to everything from screening to the education and corporate versions, the healthcare version and billing and all kinds of stuff. It's <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. And you can find more about the pursuit of growth at our website, www.thepursuitofgrowth.com. You can also follow us on social media. All of our um, platforms are on our website. So go check us out, follow us there. Um, you've heard us talk a lot about the book in this episode. So you can go to our website, purchase the book. Shameless plug by Sammy. Thank you, sir. And uh, man, we just encourage people, man, grow in your personal life, grow in your professional life, use those skills to serve others, man. And at the end of the day, just live TPG. Christian, once again, man, thanks so much for coming on here. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I think you gave me, I think you gave our audience a lot to think about and some actionable tips. And I just wanted to take away again what Sammy said. Every single person watching this, go to Christian's website and take the assessment. It only takes what it took me a minute and a half, maybe. And it's amazing what you get from it. There's no reason not to take that test. Agreed. That's awesome. And for everyone that orders the Pursuit of Happiness book or Pursuit of Growth book in the next five minutes, uh, Greg is going to come to your house with a boom box and read it outside your window. <laughs> and haunt your dreams forever. <laughs> and, and I'll sing In Your Eyes um, by Peter Gabriel while I hold that boom box above no doubt about it. What don't you shoot him. We are in Texas. Don't shoot him. <laughs> Christian, I know, I know where Irving is, so watch out, brother. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. This was absolutely amazing. I had a lot of fun with you. You made it really, really fun. So thank you. Very cool, man. Well, we'll talk again soon, man. Enjoy the rest of the night. We'll see you soon.